I'm Amy Pruitt. I'm Lisa Dumas. I teach Ayurveda and yoga. I teach yoga. I'm a yoga therapist in training and I offer transformational coaching. But that's just part of the story. We're moms, daughters, wives, and friends. We're always learning and we've both experienced healing by what we teach. And the intention of this podcast is to offer you our favorite tools from the traditions and sciences that support us as we navigate the realities and stressors of modern life. Each week, we'll share stories, answer your questions, and talk to others who inspire us. Welcome to the Radiant Warrior Podcast. Yoga and Ayurveda to reclaim a courageous heart. On this episode, I'm flying solo. It's me, Lisa, and I'm missing my podcast co-host, Amy Pruitt. Amy is not only a registered nurse in Columbus, Ohio, but she owns her own yoga studio, the beautiful Radiant Yoga and Wellness in Columbus. And she is following some directives and going about the very hard and emotional task of closing down the studio for a couple of weeks, not to mention that her work in the healthcare sector is keeping her very busy at this time. So we are wishing Amy well, and that's why there are two of us. In a partnership, one person can handle things if the other person cannot. And we wanted to make sure that we were available to conduct this beautiful interview that we're sharing with you today. We have invited a wonderful, gifted, very skilled yoga teacher from here in Vancouver, BC, Canada, onto the program today. And one of the reasons that we wanted to air an episode like this at this time is because Sarah is very much into the epic grand mythology that is part of the roots and the underpinnings of the yoga practice. She is informed by that. She teaches about that. And listening to stories can be a very heartening and perspective widening experience for us as human beings. This is how we have been entertained for centuries. This is how we used to learn about ourselves and the world. And in many different cultures, this is more prevalent. We obviously still love our stories. Look at the way we watch television and go to movies and follow storylines and reality TV. We're just wired for it. So we have invited Sarah on this episode to not only speak with us about some of the roots of yoga, which are so interesting for all of us, in my opinion, whether you have a yoga practice or not. Um, and then she's going to let us sit back and relax and take our minds off of everything that's going on and some of the more dire news that we are surrounded by at this time and listen to an inspiring story. So that is on the way. And Amy and I wanted to offer a little bit of information at this time you know, when we teach together, we often teach about emotions and how we can be guided by them rather than completely toppled by them. And there's a lot of fear in the air and in the news and in our communities. And there is a meaning of healthy fear. And there is a way that we can engage with healthy fear. There's a wonderful text that Amy and I have referred to in this podcast a few times called The Language of Emotions, written by Carla McLaren. And this is an essential book. Uh, many therapists that I know use this book in their work because it helps us to purposefully engage with different emotions so that we can separate from them slightly and inquire into them rather than be completely succumbed by them. And she talks about the difference between healthy fear and maybe more dysregulated fear and how healthy fear is how we feel when we're driving or when we're riding a bike through our city, you know, we're alert and we're alert because we need to know the next appropriate action to take because ultimately we're wired for survival. So fear here. If we can separate from the panic of it and from the reactivity of it and from how much stress we create in our systems when we move into what ifs and if we can just ask ourselves okay what action needs to be taken 
And in the work I've done around soothing anxious bodies and minds, I've taken that a step further when it comes to maybe our more irrational fears that all of us, especially those of us who are tipping more over into anxiousness can entertain. And that question can be, what's the most loving action that I can take? And I'm thinking about Amy and I'm offering this in honor of Amy and the hard actions that she's taking in her community. They're coming from a place of care and love from her community. They are not coming from a place of fear and panic. And she expressly communicates that to her community. And so that's our offering from the Radiant Warrior podcast now is what's the most loving action that we can take for not only ourselves, but for others in our community and others in our world. And maybe if we know that the possibility is two weeks in our home, that means two weeks worth of supplies and not more so that we are depriving our neighbors and those in our community of what they might need. What's the most loving action that we can take right now for ourselves and for the people in community? Thank you for listening. And without further ado, we are so happy to welcome a wonderful teacher of yoga. She's a longtime yoga student. She's a teacher trainer here in Vancouver at the Sempreviva Yoga Yoga Teacher School. She also holds very inspiring public classes here at Sempreviva. She has online meditations and some online offerings as well, which she talks about near to the end of our conversation. Please enjoy Sarah Cutfield. Sarah, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. I'm, I'm super excited to be here. Well, one of my favorite questions to ask fellow yoga teachers, and I think it's an interesting answer whether we teach yoga or not, because it's so interesting to find out how somebody came to something that they love so much. So I'm interested in your personal yoga story. What brought you to the yoga mat in the first place? So it, it came about um, rather unexpectedly, I guess you could say, and it was a long time ago now. I've been practicing the better part of a quarter century, about 23, 23, almost 24 years. And I'd been a very introspective kid, still am an introspective person, I'm really interested in philosophy, spirituality, reading, um, all those kinds of things. And... My parents wanted me to have a physical activity, was not into team sports, pretty much post, you know, played soccer for a couple of years, did that kind of thing, but I wasn't into, into team sports or traditional activities like that, and they wanted me to have a, a physical activity. So they found me a yoga VHS tape, and mm -hmm. put, me in, put me in the basement and said, here you go, and that was it, and I was kind of love at first feel, I guess. I, I just glommed onto it like a like it, I had been doing it my whole life. And it was with, I don't know if you're familiar with Kathy Smith at all, mm -hmm. She's a, an American exercise instructor, but she actually had a yoga tape with Rod Stryker. Mm -hmm. So my very first yoga teacher was, was Rod Stryker, which, and he continues to be one of the most influential teachers in my practice and in my in my studentship to this day but I started in my my family basement trying to figure out all these different forms and following along with the tape and there wasn't a lot of public yoga in uh, at all anyway at that time um, I was 14 15 and uh, and then I found a class at a community center that was nearby and was the youngest person by <laughs> by a lot but I remember getting on the mat and I don't really remember anything the instructor said. I vaguely remember her kind of energy, but not her face or her name or anything. But I remember how she made me feel. And I remember how yoga made me feel. And that pretty much launched me. After that, I was practicing mostly on my own and doing a lot of reading up until when I was able to get into a larger urban environment where there was more options for classes and, and getting out there physically. and trying different styles and then flash forward to now where I've been teaching for 11 years and, and making this pretty much my full-time career. So mm. that's, the nutshell, that's the nutshell version of it. How has having this practice for so long throughout your teenage years and into now supported you and broadened maybe your perspective of this life and yourself? There was a, there's been moments where I've definitely felt bigger than I am. 
about the same time when I was starting to practice, my parents would send my sister and I to a sleepaway camp in the Rocky Mountains. I grew up in Alberta. And we would do hiking and backpacking trips and canoeing and horseback riding and things like that. And so we would be out, these groups of young teens with, with guides and leaders, for several days. And in this one instance, we got on the wrong track. And we ended up, because we had to navigate ourselves and we didn't have GPS. We were, you know, our, our instructors, our guides were literally looking at the topographical maps and we were following routes that were established, but we had to learn to orient for ourselves. In this one instance, um, we'd, we read, we'd misread the map. And so instead of the trail that we were supposed to be on, we'd actually gone up a mountain. And this is like a mountain, not a little hill, not a thing, but like shale, scree, climbing for six hours straight up, you know, the whole, the whole thing. But at a certain point, even realizing that we maybe weren't on the right track, there, there wasn't enough time to, to backtrack. We basically had to get up and over and down because that would be the shortest route. And at the time, I was, you know, 14, 15, didn't think much of it. I was like, oh, we're just climbing this mountain. I'm sure our guides were panicking, but they were very good about keeping calm and, and not letting the rest of us know they were stressed. But we've been climbing and climbing and climbing, and this is kind of classic, right? We're literally on a mountain. And it's so often used as a metaphor for the journey towards that kind of attainment or, or realization. But we're climbing and we're hot and we're sweaty and it's getting late and, and we're, we're tired. And now we're kind of getting a little bit like, what's, what's going on? But I remember getting to the peak and standing on the top of this peak, surrounded by the vista of the Rockies and this absolute clear blue sky and and we were as high as I had ever been like barring being in an airplane higher than I'd ever been in my life looking at the absolute expanse and vastness and just unending kind of epicness of that landscape and not feeling lost in it not feeling small or scared or diminished in any way, feeling like I was as big as what I was seeing. Mm. Feeling like it was just, just, I was, I was that big. I was that part of that with a capital P. Like it's, it's just one of those moments where I remember being united being being more than I thought myself to be knowing not even not even just kind of oh that's cool like absolutely in my bones knowing that I was as big as what I was seeing that I was part of what I was seeing and and that I don't know that that would have stuck as clearly if I hadn't started thinking about those ideas I love hearing those stories and it's something to open ourselves and put ourselves in the way of being open for those experiences in our life. Um, I wonder, because you had such so many years of yoga practice behind you, was it a natural to flow into teaching or did you move down any other routes before settling on teaching yoga? I never intended to teach, to be honest. Even when I first took my, uh, my first teacher training back in 2009, the intention was simply to deepen my own knowledge and my personal practice. As, as I think a lot of students do, and especially nowadays, now that I am a teacher trainer, I uh, see so many people coming to, to trainings and workshops and, and even to the mat itself because they're seeking that sense of self and they're seeking that communication and that, that quality of relationship with themselves and with the world around them through, through that lens. But when I first landed as a student in teacher training, I had a completely different career. I went to school for theater. As a technician, I wasn't. A, I did performing for fun. I enjoyed it, but it, but my my kind of career trajectory was as a designer and a stage manager and a theater tech, and was practicing alongside. And when I had the opportunity to to take the training, it was because I wanted to for myself. And as I was moving through the program, and you know, part practice teaching was part of it, and as a lot of programs have, I thought, you know, this would be a nice thing to complement what I'm already doing because. Theater jobs are contract based. You know, I don't always have something to go to, so I could sub or I could teach, you know, the cast or, or that kind of thing. I think education has always been in my blood. My mother, my father, and my sister were all educators in some realm in, in their respective fields. 
and it felt very natural and it felt very possible but it wasn't something I planned and once I'd finished teacher training and came back to my theater career I did start subbing and and that kind of thing but it wasn't ever going to be a total career and then it took a, a big life a life pivot as it often does mm -hmm. and a big move um, to reorient myself and I, I basically landed in a space where I was handed a, a ton of opportunities very very grateful for that to basically make yoga my, my profession and it kind of rolled from there and then flash forward to to where we are now you know six seven years later and over the span of, of that 11 year teaching the first two or three were were not on the path of oh, the first two I guess were, weren't, weren't on the path of this is what I want to do and now it's all I do so. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I had that in common with you my first teacher training I had not intended to teach and then upon graduation the owner of the studio basically said so this is the class you'll teach and right, yeah. and it the more I did it the more I realized that I can't I mean there's definitely other paths that mm. I have taken but that piece of sharing the gifts of yoga with other people it's just so incredibly fulfilling it's a better day for me when I am sharing it and that leads me to wondering if your why for teaching has evolved over the years based on what the gifts of yoga offer you. Is there a deeper why that has emerged when it comes to what brings you into the yoga room with a group of students each day? I think over the years I've been able to clarify and articulate with more ease and more impact my why, but I think my why has always been that moment on the mountain, that moment of we are so much more than we think we are and how can we step into to the very best of our ability and our circumstances and our, our whatever's going on for us in our lives, whatever that might be, we are more and we are united in that. Whatever our belief system, our faith system, the tools we choose, the way we choose to access it, we're not bound by this flesh and bone, essentially. And the practice has always been one of alchemy for me in the sense of we think we're one thing and we take an experiment and through applying all these different variables and different aspects of ourselves and different teachers and approaches and, and invitations, we become something else. And I don't necessarily mean better because that can imply that who we are right now is not good enough and that's not where I where I take that I I mean we evolve we change we reveal and so I'm so interested in exploring that and through through different lenses the body of course for one I, you know, I teach vinyasa flow and the body is very primary to that kind of idea but I also teach yin and hatha and meditation and philosophy and, and bringing in so many different parts of the practice can start to reveal different parts of ourselves. They're all all these different pieces that we're starting to put together. And so I think over the years, as much teaching and study as I've done has allowed me to clarify that why and, and express it a little bit more with, more, with more efficacy. But the why hasn't really changed since since kind of first landing on that mat and listening to Rod's voice or standing on that mountain and going, oh, mm -hmm. we're so much more. We're so much more. How do I, how do I find who I am, essentially? And, and yoga for me was one of those things that allowed me a language to do that in. I would invite everybody listening to really take that in. I want to highlight what you said. We are so much more than we think we are. And when you said that, it does feel like some deep truth on some level, like uh, even though you and I can't see one another in this conversation, you know, there was just a deepening connection in that moment. And that's a central message that I hope to get across in my work around um, soothing an anxious mind and body is that we are so much more than anxiety. And it's so easy in this media saturated world to define ourselves with our roles or maybe with our perceived faults. And any kind of practice that takes us away from the day-to-day -day and maybe shifts the lens that we see our life through, whether that be yoga, meditation, or any practice that serves anybody who's listening, it can open up the truth that 
we are more than the roles that we play in our lives. So I want to just highlight that you spoke those words. We need to hear that more often. Um, I love that. Thank you so much. And you've mentioned that you have gone down the vinyasa path and that you do teach different styles of yoga. But I think whether our listeners are really into yoga or not, it would be a good question to ask you about demystifying the difference between vinyasa and hatha yoga for our listeners. I'm always asked, you know, what kind of yoga do you teach? And so I know yeah. that you can articulate the difference between the two quite well based on your experience. When I first started practicing, it was just yoga. It was just like we were just doing yoga. The, the asana was the asana, the breath was the breath, the, the, you know, all these different threads being woven together. So something that really strikes home for me is looking to the original meanings of some of these words because students are often seeing what a studio is labeling the class as so that they get a sense of what the physicality will be like in the room. And visually, Yes, a vinyasa practice is generally, generally going to be more physically dynamic, cardiovascular, depending on the student, depending on the teacher, does typically tend to offer more challenging variations or asana that's of a, a more challenging or difficult degree. But hatha is equally as challenging, is just challenging in a different way. And what I mean by that is, Hatha, or Hatha, as we might be used to pronouncing it, can translate to mean forceful or effortful. And Hatha is really the umbrella for all yoga. You could argue that all yoga styles fall under this category because Hatha also translates to mean sun and moon or essentially the union or the uniting of complementary opposites. So every polarity and pair that we have in the universe, right? Light and dark, masculine and feminine, sun, moon, light, heavy, that kind of thing. So where we have two different schools of thought or differing, differing paths is that on the one hand, we have a studio or a teacher trying to define and describe what it is they offer in the room so that students have an idea. And you'll see any number of different ranges from Hatha one, Hatha two, Vinyasa, Vinyasa power flow, Vinyasa flow, flow, <laughs> power, right? We've We've created all of this description to really just indicate, okay, in this one, you're going to be moving a lot. In this one, you're going to be slower. But warrior two is warrior two. The fundamentals don't change. The way in which they are sequenced together, the pace at which they're offered, the degree of variation, those are the factors that start to change. And so I'm really interested in teaching teachers to be challenging, yes, to push students to, and I don't mean past an edge, I simply mean ask them to step into the fullness of their capability over time and with safety and recognize that yes, in some bodies and in some circumstances, certain shapes are just not going to be the way that they look on Instagram or the way that they look like in the teacher's body, and that's not a bad thing, it's just part of it. But when we create this hierarchy between, oh, I have to start with hatha and then I can go to vinyasa, or vinyasa is the hard one and hatha is the easy one, we diminish, I think, the, the possibility in both cases. If we only ever say vinyasa is the hard one, then we don't give ourselves the opportunity to try. And if we only ever say hatha is the easy one, then we don't give ourselves the opportunity to slow down and be more mindful and actually activate every single aspect of our pose. Vinyasa, the word itself, actually in the Sanskrit can translate to mean doing something on purpose like you mean it. Nyasa, to place in a special way, essentially. So vinyasa means doing something on purpose, with intention, with integrity, with awareness, with all of that behind you. So any breath cycle done with integrity, any walking from your car to your office with clarity and, and intentionality and specificity, any action. My grandmother used to protect doing the dishes. This was before the, before the days of dishwashers. And, uh, and she would protect that time three times a day because she had a really busy life. She had these, these full days and the, doing the dishes was her moment to stop and breathe and focus and calm and come back to herself because she didn't have 
the opportunity to get on a mat or a cushion or, or go for a walk and you know, do those things for herself. So doing the dishes became it. And so she was doing something on purpose, like she meant it. And I'm not saying every single time was like that, but that's doing a vinyasa. So there's the physical expression of it. There's the linking of breath and movement together. There's this idea that the postures flow from one to another, that we're in this, in this connectivity and the physicality of it. But at the same time, anything is a vinyasa. Oh, yes. When we're on a yoga mat, our invitation is always doing something on purpose in a special way. And doing that on the yoga mat has helped me to do that in my life. And that's been incredibly powerful for me. I think that's why we keep coming back. Because at the end of the day, we could go to the gym, you know, and and get stronger quadriceps much faster than doing (laughs) warrior two for, you know, five breaths in one class. Like, it's, that's what's so fascinating to me is physically, yes, the practice can change our bodies and bring strength and all these things, but there are other ways to get those benefits. And yet we keep showing back up on the mat to mm-hmm. do to do what, right? And, and I think you, you just said it, right? We, we, we come back because of how the practice makes us feel, not, not because we can articulate it necessarily. We just feel better we feel different we feel changed we feel transformed in some way and whether we subscribe that purely to a physical sensation or not it's real so we keep showing back up we keep doing it Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and there are so many explanations from you know yogic stance that we do feel that way now sarah you are translating from the spiritual language of sanskrit and i have been in the yoga room when you have been teaching about this because you have been a devout student of this language and whether you're into yoga or not this is an incredibly interesting language the first time mm-hmm. i learned about it and i learned that the sounds that your mouth makes the movements that your tongue makes how your tongue hits the upper palate when you are pronouncing some of these sanskrit terms has an effect on the body more than we can understand um, mm-hmm. can you share a little bit about the system of this language how it's thought to affect the practitioner and how it's meant to be used. And maybe just a little bit more background, if anybody has been in a yoga room or even heard anything about yoga, the names of the postures are in this language of Sanskrit. Many of the classic texts are written in Sanskrit. So I'll let you take it from there. Yeah, thank you. I, I always love sharing about I'm, about uh, this. I'm a bit of a language nerd. And what I love about the language first and foremost is that it's a feeling based language. It's a vibrational based language. So we know that we're affected by sound very deeply, right? You hear the voice of someone you love versus the voice of someone who really annoys you and you respond very physically, very viscerally. You hear your breakup song, you hear your pump up jam, you you know, you hear someone crying, you hear someone laughing, there's there's this immediate emotional and physiological response to sound stimulus. We're wired for it. Our bones are hollow, our our you know, at the at the base of them, the we're sacks of water, right? We're pretty much built of material that's going to conduct energy and sound frequency particularly. So Sanskrit is a language that's incredibly old, incredibly, incredibly old. It's one of the oldest that we know of. And we know it's one of the oldest because of when we can find written dated record of it, but we assume that it's a, and we and we sort of know from oral tradition that it was something that was being created well before that. Right? With most language, the sound comes first and then the written form. Arguably not all, but, but in this case, for sure, we would say the Sanskrit language started as sound itself and then transitioned into the written form and went further from there. But uniquely, and you have to take this with whether you want to fall on the side of, well, prove it or fall on the side of, I believe that, mm-hmm. Sanskrit was said to be a received language, a, a heard language. So in deep states of meditation, in deep states of communion with whatever you believe to be out there. You can use the word divine as a, as a kind of placeholder for that. And interestingly, div, D-I-V, div is a Sanskrit root. It means the shining or the luminous or the shining one. So divine has a Sanskrit root, even though 
we might not have realized it, we're using Sanskrit. And this language was said to have been heard, not made up. So in English, for example, when we need a new word for something, a new object that we've created, we make a word for it. Sometimes we break apart other words, we put things together, or we just come up with a completely new word to, to explain what an object is, to represent it. So if I held up a watch, for example, we could have any number of words to describe it. We would say, oh, that's a watch, or that's a wrist watch, because that's where we wear it. It's black, it's digital, it's not, it's all these things. But with Sanskrit, the word is the thing. So for a very common word that you might hear in a yoga room, shanti, shanti, or peace. Now, peace is the English translation of what shanti is. But when you say shanti, the idea is in Sanskrit that you are actually creating the vibration, the frequency the embodiment, the resonance of peace. So just like you would take a form like a triangle pose or a tree and that has an uh, impact on your physical form, the sound, and in Sanskrit it particularly, because it was created or heard, received, offered out as a purely spiritual language, not as a colloquial or kind of casual everyday conversational language, you were infusing and embodying and creating within yourself sonically you know, representing what you were bringing out of the sound. So peace or any number of these other words. So Sanskrit is a proto-Indo-European language, meaning it's one that has been filtered through and is so old that it's had an influence and an impact on other languages. Our word navy, for example, or naval, meaning related to boats, um, not your naval center like your belly button, mm -hmm. but boats. Mm -hmm. um, nav. Nav. Nav means boat in Sanskrit. So mm -hmm. naval and navy. So we're getting these influences coming through, making those correlations. To give you a very current modern example, James Cameron's film from a number of years ago now, Avatar. An avatar is an avatara. An avatara in Sanskrit, literally the divine or a, a you know, conscious, divine conscious being embodied in a human form or essentially in an interface in order to interact in the regular world. So you have a consciousness or a self being put in a form in order to be able to interact with an environment. Just like in the movie, the soldier's consciousness is placed in the alien form so that it can be taken out and, and interacted with the other environments and, and aliens around it. So avatar, avatar, avatar is in the gaming community as well. You have your avatar in your game, which is the, the digital representation of yourself, essentially. So my Sanskrit teacher, Manorama, said something once which always sticks with me, and I love it. She says, learning Sanskrit or playing with the sounds themselves is, is like doing asana in your mouth. Because mm -hmm. it takes, mm -hmm. you know, it is one of those things. It's, it is literally learning a second language. And why I think that's important for one to do at all in a yoga space, but also to, to do with as much, as much intention towards correct pronunciation as you can, is one, we're offering respect and reverence and acknowledgement to the cultural and spiritual tradition that this practice comes from, and not separating out those elements because they're hard or different or we don't really need them in order to do a shape. I would argue, in fact, the opposite, because if you have a shape like Virabhadrasana, for example, warrior, the warrior shape, Vir is the hero and Abhra means great. So Virabhra, Virabhadrasana. Asana, at its original meaning, was seat, that which you are sitting on, that's what you are placed in. So here, you're taking the shape of warrior one and we know the alignment or the position of the body because we've labeled it warrior one and that gives us a, a sense of clarity especially if it's in English and I would always encourage teachers to use both Sanskrit and English if they're going to use Sanskrit in their classes define it make it accessible don't don't create it to be this barrier of oh I know something you don't or that's mm -hmm. the fancy word and all things but to be able to correlate the physicality with this internal environment, which I think is at least 
90% of the practice. Mm -hmm. You know, 10% gets us there, gets us in the door, and then 90% of it is how do I feel once I'm in this form? Mm -hmm. What do I learn about my life from that experience, right? How can I take that and translate it into everything else I do? Then it becomes not so much, oh, I'm just doing the warrior and pretending to be the warrior, but in, in the flip side of it, I am. I am. And yoga is not an, an action. Yoga is a state of being. Mm -hmm. So if we're moving into that realm of being, then, then we are tuning to the frequency. We're finding that, that inner resonance or vibrational quality. And so utilizing sound is much like utilizing the body or much like utilizing the mind in a way. It's just, it's another tool. It's another access point. I wanted to have you share about Sanskrit because I know when new practitioners enter into a yoga room for some of them, and was the case for me, when we hear mm -hmm. unfamiliar chanting, it can feel unfamiliar and it can feel confronting. And when I heard you speak about how the word, by saying the word, by pronouncing the word, our body is having an experience of the meaning of that word. I've never heard somebody say it so beautifully. And that's a game changer. And that really invites a practitioner to try it on because sometimes with our linear brains, we have to know what everything means and why we're doing everything. And I also love that too. However, there's a time maybe to just try and feel and have the experience of it. And Sarah, I also love that you are talking about the roots of yoga and Sanskrit is completely tied in to the history of yoga. Now, for those that are coming to practice without any education about its history, what do you wish that the average person knows about yoga's roots? And how do you feel that we can best honor that in the West while translating the practice to really fit into our contemporary lives? Because things are much different now. Mm. I think at its heart, yoga was meant as a spiritual practice and the body is part of that and the physical form and the physical exercise is part of that too but yoga was meant as a spiritual practice and i i deliberately use that word instead of religious mm -hmm. because i think there can often be a bit of resistance or a bit of fear or a bit of okay i i, I don't want this to be religious so i'm just going to focus on the body so being very conscious that yoga is a philosophical system, not a religious system, but because of where it originated and because faith and spirituality and, and religion are such a big part of that environment, continues to be to this day, but it, you know when it was originally formed as well, they go hand in hand, they go alongside each other. But because yoga is a philosophical practice, it can also be spiritual. It could also be physical. It could also incorporate elements of faith, but not necessarily have to subscribe to any one particular definition of that. And so all of those forms and expressions are welcome. Now, you might see iconography or hear texts or things like that that are so parallel to the yogic practice express so many of the ideals and the ideas that are being offered within this that it can seem more religious in nature or or as if it's being asked to invite that space in. And that will a lot depend, I think, on the on the translator, meaning the teacher and also the receiver, the the person who is on the mat receiving it. And so I absolutely get that chanting or speaking or even thinking the word om or saying namaste at the end of a practice might be something that is a barrier at first and which is why I always offer the option to opt out I say you know please mm -hmm. feel free to join me or to listen and I never require someone to to say namaste to me I will always offer it because I I know what it means to me and so more than anything I think I'd love people to explore yoga as a practice that's bigger than the body and understand that that's where it originally started from it was a form of expression around devotion around exploration around asking the bigger questions in life of ourselves and of the world around us in the ancient days yoga was very radical you know we see it as a very ubiquitous thing now it's you know especially living where you and i both do here in, in vancouver canada it's it's you can't turn around without bumping <laughs> into someone with a yoga mat or seeing a space and that's not a bad thing but there's certainly a 
a saturation in a commercial or more material aspect that I think has, has altered our viewpoint of it. And coming back to really the heart of, of the intentionality of it, but also realizing at the time it was a really big deal to, to do this practice. You had to leave your family, you had to leave your job, you went off to a mountain or an ashram or a cave or separating yourself from society. And excuse me, one of the biggest shifts that I think we've seen in in the you know duration of yoga is not only has yoga endured, but it's become a householder practice. And it's moved from those contemplative spiritual separate yourself kind of roots into I can do this on the way home from work and then go and pick my kids up and then come back and do my cooking and, and all the things. Or I can, you know, do it on my lunch break or I can get up at 4 a.m. and do it with the sunrise if I choose to, right? We have so much more access and so much more opportunity to bring the practice into our everyday lives in a, in a much different way. And the population of yoga has changed over the years, who's, who's predominantly practicing it, particularly in the West. And I don't think change is a bad thing. In fact, you know, I'd rather argue that we have these, these principles to live by in our everyday lives than, than not. But I also think honoring what the original intention of this practice was and is, finding a way to make those elements relevant to us within the context of our lives. If OM doesn't work for you, awesome. You take a really big breath in and a really big breath out and go, I honor that I showed up and that I am here with like-minded people who want the same things out of life that I do. And isn't that amazing? And that's what OM means to me, and I'm just going to think about that while the teacher's doing it or while everybody else around me is doing it. Or when someone says namaste, I can acknowledge that it was a unique and really special thing to get to show up on Tuesday night and, and do this, and thank you. And, and thank you to myself and thank you to other people and the person who was in front of me offering these tools. You know, it's, it's a sense of gratitude, a sense of reverence. And so if we come back to the idea with the Sanskrit that the, the word is the thing, then namaste is just, I'm, I'm really grateful for this opportunity, for this interaction, for this eye contact, for this movement, for this breath. I'm just really grateful. And that's a feeling at the end of the day. Mm-hmm. You're, not just, is, you're not just saying thank you. You're actually uh, yeah. the entire feeling of thank you. I just love that. And you're, cha- you know, you're changing over time, all the time, no matter what the influence is. So I think yoga is one of those sort of filters that we're seeing the world through. And that's, that's a beautiful opportunity. So I choose to see yoga as that spiritual practice because I know that's how it makes me feel. And I would offer as a teacher those tools that have helped me and those those ways of, of moving and being that have helped me so as you do I know you do so that there's an access point for people to to share in that opportunity but I think if we're going to continue to practice we also have a bit of a responsibility as students to understand where this came from why it's here the, the origin culture and to utilize elements in a respectful way and I know there's a lot of talk you know about oh well should I as a teacher even use Sanskrit am I allowed to what about this image and and so for me what I would share is partly over the years I've experienced Indian students and and students from India here students who are of Indian origin um, say to me thank you for bringing these pieces back into space Mm -hmm because that is part of it and thank you for doing it in a way that makes it accessible and relevant I'm not asking anybody to convert I, I you know nothing like that it's not a religion but I am in the understanding that these are parts of the practice too and I want to make them feel real for people not a barrier but also not get rid of them because there might be that edge of uncomfortability I think if we do that entirely then we are taking on something that and turning it into something else without those roots. But as teachers, we also have to be careful that we're not just namaste because that's what we're supposed to do at the end of class because that vibration, that's felt. If you don't mean it, if it's not relevant to you, if it's not something that's authentic to you, people will will feel and hear that and they will choose to interpret that from you. You know, mm-hmm. it's that, that first impression kind of idea. Mm-hmm. So... I think it's a negotiation. I think everybody as an interpreter of this practice, as a translator of this practice, is going to be different. But I would strongly 
from my personal perspective, encourage us not to leave the spiritual, philosophical, meditative study aspects of this practice behind for the sake of the body. I think the body is, is one aspect, one element of what we do. And your answer is a big part of why we wanted you to be on the show, because there's there's a place for more conversation about this. And after hearing you teach about it, it's just so clear that you're such a committed student, very well read on the subject. And so I love the way that you speak about the roots of yoga and about Sanskrit. And a lot of these postures that we do teach, you know, when students do hear these unfamiliar terms for them, mm. um, a lot of the names of the postures have their roots in epic stories and myths from India. Now, I know that that has been a big part of your practice and you offer workshops based on mythology and how we can take these big concepts and apply them to our contemporary lives. So when Amy and I were talking about having you on and when I was bragging about you, um, we thought it would be fun, especially right now. I think we just need a story. <laughs> We need, we need someone to tell us a story. We were hoping that you could share maybe a favorite myth with us and then offer what you would hope, even though everybody is going to, as you say, distill it in their own way through their own lens, but maybe mm -hmm. what you would teach others to consider when it comes to their own lives based on the myth, if you wouldn't mind. One of my very favorite ways of experiencing yogic teaching, because I think I received this actually from um, Sienna Sherman. She's a, a, a teacher who uses a lot of mythology and storytelling in, in her her offerings. And she offered once that, that I totally landed with. And, you know, we come back again and again to the same stories often because each time we hear it from a different time in our life, so it lands differently. We, we see a different aspect of ourselves in it. Some days we're the hero, some days we're the villain, some days we're the bystander. But in, in all repetitions or hearings of story, we are part of it. And so I've watched children, but I've also watched adult learners absolutely light up when someone tells them a story. There's something so innately human about being part of a story. And in fact, our, our brains are wired for it. Brene Brown speaks of this. She talks about how our brain will actually seek conclusion to a narrative and it won't feel satisfied until it has it. Mm -hmm. And then there's a, there's a release of chemicals in your brain once you have that satisfaction. And I don't necessarily mean a happy ending. We need a conclusion, which is often why we project what's going to happen in any different interaction because we want to know the end result now. And we get a, a feedback loop in, a, in our brain chemically with, with in regards to hearing that, that, that conclusion, the end. And we go, ah, oh, yes. Is this something so nourishing about it? Maybe you are explaining the popularity of binge watching, because if we know there's another episode, we have got to we find out what end. happens. Yeah, totally. <laughs> well, an oral oral culture in yoga, but, but in general, has been something that's been, you know, we sit around the fire mm -hmm. to learn about ourselves and about our societies. And, and uh, that hasn't changed because now it's the flicker of a TV screen instead of the flicker of a flame. It's, <laughs> It's still, we're gathering, and then we get together to talk about it after. But, um, so you, you'd asked me before we started this to, to maybe consider telling a story. And so I, some, you know, I had a couple in the, in the back of my mind that I thought I might tell, but I thought I'll, I'll see where the conversation goes and which story lands with me after, after what we speak about. And so this is one I think that will tie some of the, the different pieces we've talked about today together. Hey, okay, take it away, Sarah. I'm so excited. <laughs> so I'll invite you, depending on where you are, to just find a, a bit of a comfortable seat. And that could be sitting up, or you might choose to curl up, you might choose to lie down. It's entirely up to you. And whether you choose to keep your eyes open or not, take a few deep breaths and just soften. Long ago, and not so long ago, there was Krishna. Now, Krishna... Krishna is special. He is actually an avatara. He's the divine embodiment of Vishnu, the sustainer and the protector. And the one who is strong. The one who brings balance when things are out of order. But Vishnu himself lives in the divine realms. And his essence, his totality would be too big, too all-encompassing to land in 
the everyday, the mundane realm, and, and not basically blow it to smithereens. So when he comes down to Earth, he comes in a form, an avatar. And Krishna is one of his avatar. And in this case, Krishna has been sent to Earth with a very particular purpose. That is well down the line from where we are right now. Krishna is just a little boy at this point. It's important to note that in most of Hindu or Indian yogic mythology and, and story, when God comes to intervene in a situation, it's because the world about is out of balance, but he, he or she doesn't just come down and press a magic button and make it all go away. More often than not, the form that they embody is meant to interface and interact with humanity and help humanity come to terms with what they need to do to move forward. So there's a long time before Krishna is really going to intervene in what he needs to put to balance in the world in this particular situation. Krishna has been born to a royal family. Technically, he's a prince, but he has a jealous uncle who's wanting the throne for himself. So his parents learn of this plot when Krishna is a baby and they send him away. They trick the uncle and send Krishna to be raised by cow herders. Krishna grows up running through fields and herding cows and generally getting into trouble. He's a terribly mischievous little boy, as they tend to be, right? But more than most, I mean, he'll pinch, he'll pinch things off laundry lines and drag them through the mud, screaming and laughing. He'll open the gates and let the cows free. They go scattering everywhere after they've been herded up for the night and everybody has to go out and herd them again. And he's always getting into trouble. He sticks fists into everybody's buttermilk vats after they've been churned and smears himself with the buttermilk glistening in the sunshine. He'll run around screaming. Now, if any other child in the little village where Krishna is growing up did this, they'd get a smack. This was just not done. They'd, they'd have to go and herd the cows back themselves or wash the laundry themselves or re-churn the buttermilk, but not Krishna. Every time Krishna gets into trouble or does something naughty, he has this way about him. He looks up at the adult whose finger is out and he just blinks, shakes his little head, and somehow the adult always ends up pinching him on the cheek and, oh, Krishna sends him on his way. Now, the students in, the, in his school and his brother even, everybody around him is getting so annoyed with Krishna, right? Every time, every time Krishna gets away with it. And Krishna's brother's name is Balaram, where we get Balasana, or child pose from. But Balaram, he's had it. He's had it up to here. He's so determined that the next time Krishna gets into trouble, he's going to get into trouble, like for real this time. Because every time Balaram does something naughty, he gets punished for it. Every time Krishna does something naughty, he gets a cookie and he's just fed up. Now, one week it rains, and I mean monsoon rain. It is deluging down, rivers running through the streets, and dark skies for days and days, and everybody's cooped up inside. Baladam and Krishna are driving their mother, Yashodara, crazy. She's just had it up to here. Right? They've been wrecking stuff. They've been drawing on the walls because they're out of paper. They're just done. And finally, Finally, the rain starts to soften, and the clouds start to break apart, and the sun starts to shine, and everybody takes a big sigh of relief. And you show that it looks at the boys, and she says, oh my goodness, okay, I just need an hour. Go out and play. The rain has stopped. I just need an hour. I need to get the house back in order. I need to take five minutes for myself. Go outside. Get out of my hair. But, and she looks both boys in the eye, and she says, but, please. I have too much to do today already. Do not get dirty. I don't want to have to have to deal with bath time and more laundry and all the things. You promise me. Balaram, and he nods his head. Oh, yes, Mama, I, we will be good. I promise. And she looks at Krishna. Krishna? Krishna? Oh, yes, Mama. No, no, we'll be good. I promise. I promise. We'll be good. And out the boys go to play. And they're traipsing through the field, squishing in the grass and seeing all the birds starting to fly again and sing and the sun is out. It feels so good to be outside and to be able to be free. Right? There's no walls. And they hear the rushing of the river going by. And they know that with all the rain, it's probably big and fast and pretty cool looking. So they think, let's go down and see the river. We'll be careful, but let's go down and see the river. I want to see what it looks like with all this rain. And so they traipse across the field and they can hear the roar of the water getting louder. And they can almost feel the pulsation of the energy of the speed as it rushes by, and they're getting excited. 
And as they crest up over the edge of the ridge to where the river is, they look down and sure enough, river is running twice as fast, it's twice as high, it's amazing. And there's the best mud puddle you've ever seen. It's pristine. Not even any animals have been in it yet. It's glistening in the sun. It's got that beautiful, really like tempting surface. It just looks like you want to stick your hand in it. And Krishna's eyes get really big. And Balaram's eyes get really small. He can see what his brother's thinking and his head and his eyes narrow and he looks at Krishna. And Krishna's little body is starting to vibrate. His hands are twitching next to him and he's starting to breathe a little bit faster. And Balaram puts his finger up. He says, Krishna. Krishna looks at his brother, startled out of his attention on the mud puddle. He says, Mama said, Mama said, no getting dirty, Krishna. We're not going in the mud puddle. And Krishna bobbles his head a little bit and looks up at Balaram with these really big puppy dog eyes. He says, Krishna, no, we're not going in the mud puddle. We're going to go climb that tree over there and we can see the river from the top and we'll see all the things floating by. It'll be great. And Krishna bobbles his head a little bit as if he's agreeing, and Balaram turns his back as if to go and climb the tree, and all he hears from behind him is, swoosh, whips around, and sure enough, flat on his face, in the middle of this massive, beautiful mud puddle is Krishna. And he flips himself over onto his back, and he starts making mud angels, tossing mud in the air, whipping his arms and legs around. He's giggling to himself, and he's coated from head to toe in the mud. And all you can see are the whites of his eyes and the whites of his teeth as he's laughing up at Balaram. And Balaram's arms go up in the air, and he's just so happy. Because this is it. This is it. Krishna is going to get in so much trouble. And he yells that at his brother. He's like, oh, you are in so much trouble, mister. And he runs across the field back towards their house, screaming at the top of his lungs. Ma! And you show that a rush is out of the house. She can hear Balaram's voice. She can't really hear what he's saying, but she knows something's wrong. And she's wiping her hands off coming across the field towards him, and all she can hear and see is Balaram screaming and waving. And as she gets closer, she starts to be able to hear, Mom, Krishna's in the mud! Krishna's in the mud! And she throws her hands up and hangs her head down. Typical. And then she storms across the field. She catches up with Balaram, and he's dancing around behind her. He's so happy. He's panting a little bit because he's got... All this energy, he's rushed across the field to go and get her, and he's so sure this is it. Krishna's in trouble, Krishna's in trouble. And you show that I gets to the edge of the river, and she looks down, and there, there's Krishna. He hasn't moved. He sat, waist deep in this mud puddle, covered from head to toe still. His little patty pan of mud in each of his hands, and his little cheeks bulged out to the side like a chipmunk, looking up at her with these bright, bright eyes. Clearly, he's been eating mud. Clearly, he's got something in his mouth. And she reaches down and she picks Krishna up by the ear and sets him down on the bank. Still, cheeks bulging, mud dripping off his body, little eyes looking up at him. So sweet. She looks down at him, hands on hips, and she says, Krishna? He bobbles his head at her. Cheeks puffed out to the side. She says, Krishna, what do you have in your mouth? Have you been eating mud? And he shakes his head, no. And she looks at him again, very sternly. Balaram's dancing up and down behind her. He can't contain himself. And she looks at Krishna. And she says, Krishna, what is that in your mouth? You show me, Krishna. Show me. And she reaches out with her hand and catches the bottom of Krishna's jaw. And she starts to try to open Krishna's mouth, his little cheeks bulging, his little eyes looking up at her. And she says, Krishna, open your mouth. Open your mouth and show me what's inside. And he does. And the whole world stops. All that you show that I can see whirling in Krishna's mouth are stars. The totality of the cosmos, the whole universe spinning on its axis in Krishna's mouth. When her eyes fill with this vision, she's overwhelmed. And she softens, she releases Krishna's jaw, he closes his lips, and as he does so, his cheeks come back to normal size. And the world comes back to life. And the vision fades from the shoulders, eyes, and balls. And she takes Krishna by the hand. And she takes Baladam by the hand and leads them home to clean them up and to have supper.
We are so much bigger than we think we are. We just need to remember. We need to be reminded. It's so easy to identify with the mind, with the challenge, with the trial, with the obstacles, with the mundane, with the have to get this done, and I have to wash my hands all the time, and all the things. And underneath all of that, we forget, we bury, we let it become something that is outside of ourselves. But really, we're nothing but stars. Nothing but pure awareness and possibility. And so we need to remember. And so we use our practice to remind us. Thank you so much, Sarah. My pleasure. Storytelling is truly one of your gifts and hearing you say we are so much more than we think we are i also feel like that includes we are so much more connected to one another than we think mm. about typically and i think we're being yes. shown that in so many ways around the world that our actions yeah. affect people that we have never met and what might we consider when we think about mm. that you know what how might we change the way we think and the way we live if we thought that our actions weren't just about us and our small little worlds, but had bigger effects. So, you know, that story offers a lot of opportunity for contemplation. And I know that's one of the things that you love about mm. reading the great myths is how much it does offer. I mean, you, you could study for a lifetime on one, on one stanza in some of these stories, yeah. you know, there, it's, it's so rich and, I think it was just a beautiful respite to sit and breathe and listen to some of that ancient wisdom. And I thank you so much for dedicating so much of your life to studying that on your own, distilling it and sharing it the way you so passionately and articulately do with your students. I am so passionate about the Semper Viva yoga teacher training program here in Vancouver, especially after sitting in, after being invited as a guest teacher for the last couple of cycles and watching you share this wisdom with soon to be teachers. It's so important. I, I think that you're passing it down in such a responsible caretaking way. And I thank you for that. Well, thank you for the opportunity to be on here. I I was saying this to, to you earlier, but it's my, my first time guesting on a on a podcast. So I'm, I'm really honored that it was with you. So thank mm, you. You're welcome. Um, so finding me uh, in person uh, at Semper Viva Yoga in Vancouver. I have public classes and a lot of workshop offerings as well as being the lead faculty for the, the 200 hour program here. So in person, if you're in the Vancouver uh, area, you live here or you're traveling through, please do feel free to come find me, Semper Viva Yoga there. Uh, I am on Instagram and uh, I share a lot of different things, including live sessions and different opportunities to access a little bit, a little bit of what I offer through that platform as well. So Sarah with an H dot Cutfield is my, is my handle there. And I'm on SoundCloud. I have a library of free guided meditations, including some that are story based and other offerings on SoundCloud. So you can put them there. And, uh, and I'm teaching basically right now mostly Vancouver-based, but around the world as well. So, so I'm, I might be in your neighborhood or coming there soon. And, uh, and sarahcutfield.com is my website. And we'll include all of the links to your work in our show notes. And people come from all over the world to the Semper Viva Yoga Teacher Training. So it's, mm -hmm. it's not even just in, in the Vancouver area. That's something that I notice. It's a really high quality program. And you're such a big part of it. So again, thank you, Sarah. Um, thank and you. we'll see you soon. Sounds good. Thank you so much. Lisa. Thank you for listening to the Radiant Warrior podcast. If you found it valuable, please leave us a positive review to help others find it. And please check out the Radiant Warrior podcast on Instagram and Facebook to leave us your questions and find out where you can come and practice with us next.